Today I'm presenting a comparative perspective on the exploration for universal truths from both an East Indian philosophical tradition known as Kashmir Shaivism and from contemporary Western science. And as we go along, I'll give a brief outline of relevant aspects of Kashmir Shaivism, whose roots actually are lost in antiquity and which came to its flowering in the 9th to 11th centuries CE. An urge to know the secrets of life, consciously or unconsciously, motivates much of humankind. The origins of the universe, the Big Bang, the four forces of physics, the unified field, singularities, virtual particles, all these major discoveries and theoretical formulations are important achievements of contemporary science. These ideas and phenomena have analogs in Kashmir Shaivism. Although the specific nomenclature is not identical, the concepts described are remarkably similar. Charting a comparison between concepts of contemporary science and Kashmir Shaivism, we find that contemporary science talking about the ultimate cosmic singularity that gave rise to the Big Bang. Here matter is of infinite density, all forces are infinite and unified, the unified field of course. Time, space and natural laws do not exist here. from Kashmir Shaivism, they say the first imminent principle above the created levels of vibration, which we'll get into in a minute, or Shiva Shakti, which is their term for it, is formless and all pervasive, but at the same time constitutes a small, extremely compact mass that serves as the very seed of creation. It is the most subtle expression of the power through which creation comes into being, and it has the capacity to contain within itself the entire cosmos as an embodiment of ultimate reality's unlimited powers analogous to the unified field of all forces or the powers necessary to create the universe, it can take on any form. And like the ultimate cosmic singularity that gave rise to the Big Bang, it can produce or create any and all possible forms out of itself. At this level of universal manifestation, space, time, and natural laws do not exist in this model either. The Big Bang itself, obviously, marked the beginning of the universe in contemporary, for contemporary science. And from Kashmir Shaivism, we come to the universe manifesting first on the levels of vibration and sound. As the universe developed, the forces from the unified field separated and became the four physical forces that we know in physics today, the nuclear, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity. Quoting a contemporary nuclear physicist, one or more of them, of these forces, acts at every level from the microscopic to the cosmologic to pull things together and yet keep them separated in just such a way that we in the universe are here. And from Kashmir Shaivism, quoting from a monastic scholar of Kashmir Shaivism, one of the primary powers of universal reality is the power of action. And they call it, the term is Kriya Shakti. Kriya translating to action, Shakti translating to power. As manifestation ensues, Kriya Shakti both keeps things separate and unites them. It maintains the world is separate from us and also keeps the objects in the world separate from each other so that the world does not become an amorphous conglomerate of matter. Kriya Shakti also acts as an ordering force and it establishes how forms interact with each other in space. The writings of the Eastern traditions in general use an economy of words. They often a single concept has multiple meanings or multiple purposes. For example, the model here on the flip chart, and I don't expect you to be able to read it. It's just for effect, mostly. I'm going to use the bottom and the top here for illustration. It's at once the manifestation of the universe and the manifestation of a human being. So we have the concept of us as a hologram coming from the 10th century. Furthermore, the model can be understood vertically as a movement from ultimate reality or consciousness with a capital C down to the physical manifestation in matter at the bottommost level here and back again. Or if I could flip this 90 degrees, it could be seen horizontally as the movement of awareness towards and away from an object during the act of perception. To quote a Kashmir Shaivism scholar, perception serves in this way as a paradigm for cosmogenesis and as a means of realizing the oneness and creativity of ultimate reality. 
According to Kashmir Shaivism, creation or manifestation is a subject-object relationship. The only way we know that the universe exists is because we perceive it. Therefore, the universe exists as a relationship, that, <clears throat> that between the perceiver and that which is perceived, and between the subject and the object. At the top of the model of universal manifestation is ultimate reality, oops, right here, which is both transcendent and imminent, and it's of two inseparable aspects. They're often referred to as I or Shiva and am as Shakti. Taken together in this model, they constitute what's called the supreme subject, the Shiva Shakti principle that we just talked about in that parallel with singularity and creation a moment ago. Ultimate reality or consciousness then becomes, it's not an event of creation, but a becoming. It becomes the universe and all that's manifested in it through a process of 34 stages of vibrational transformation known as the tattvas or principles of creation. It becomes what it needs to be here and here and here in order for the universe to manifest while at the same time existing beyond creation as the changeless principle, according to Kashmir Shaivism, of all changing experience. The Shiva Shakti principle and the first three created principles are included in what's known as the realm of pure creation in their words. From this perspective of Kashmir Shaivism, all that is separated from consciousness is considered impure term, and all that is in a state of unity or identity with it is considered pure. In this realm, the idea of the object, or this, is just beginning to develop, so it's perceived as being identical with consciousness. Also in this realm, neither space, time, nor natural law exist. For this reason, Kashmir Shaivism does not consider creation of the universe as a historic event. In the realm of pure creation, what we experience is that the universe is created anew in every instant. Below the realm of pure creation, are the vibrational levels of the impure creation. Here, due to certain vibrational processes that are absolutely necessary to create the world as we know it, the true nature of consciousness is veiled as it congeals itself into ultimately, here at the bottom, material existence. In this process, it is said, consciousness wills itself into a contracted state of separation from its own expansive state and free will. It becomes a limited individual perceiver, feeling cut off from the flow of consciousness, imperfect, impure, incomplete. Duality appears as a sense of identity with universal reality disappears and becomes instead an identity of being separate from it. Here also the individual perceiver is subject to the limitations of time, space, and natural law. So that's where it comes in down here. In this ordinary state of consciousness, we may perceive who we are as the physical body down here. We may perceive ourselves perhaps more of a level of the mind, which comes in about right here. Actually, what's considered the principle of the individual experiencer is just a little bit above the mind at a level known as purusha. Yet another important fact is hidden from us at the level of impure creation. That is that our ability to perceive external objects derives from the presence of identical principles residing within us. As consciousness is universe-bodied, so the individual perceiver, because consciousness becomes contracted, has the body of the entire universe in a contracted form. At this level, we're unaware or unconscious of our status as a hologram of the absolute. Everything in each creative level or tattva is a hologram of ultimate reality. This is true for both the perceiver and the perceived. So when a scientist studies the universe, it's essentially the universe studying the universe, colored by the particular attributes, psychological and other, of the individual perceivers, as well as their state of consciousness. This state, as we all well know, can fluctuate in most of us from one moment to the next, and of course, can vary significantly from one person to another due to each individual perceiver's unique attributes. It's just the way it is with humans. Abhinava Gupta, an intellectual sage of Kashmir Shaivism in the 10th century states, as is the state of consciousness, so is the experience. This could be one of the reasons that replicability of some experimental work is at times so difficult, if not impossible. 
All the more reason, say the sages of Kashmir Shaivism, to attain to the state of steady wisdom of the self. Our true nature and birthright then, according to this system, is here at the, ultimate, at the level of ultimate reality. And it is a state of consciousness attainable and in which one can become established while in human form. And here all the wavering, changing states of consciousness cease. How does this happen? While the manifestation model outlines the involution of supreme consciousness, its involvement into matter, it also maps out the stages of human evolution and transformation, whereby we can reach that state where we always have access to inspiration and creativity. It's here that we can finally come to a complete realization about the mysteries of the universe, and including who we really are. We're afforded opportunities to traverse this upward or inward transformation because part of the nature of ultimate reality here is to double back on itself. This doubling, can, doubling back can happen in more than one way. Of course, we can, of our own intention and volition, change the direction of our perception from projecting outside most of the time to becoming focused in the inner realms through some form of psycho-spiritual practice. But because of its nature, supreme consciousness continuously creates and reabsorbs the universe back into itself at fantastically high speed, going through every transformational level each time, whether or not, and usually not, we're aware of this. We experience the vibrational levels above space and time in every one of these continuously occurring acts of universal creation as the universe and we are flashed forth and reabsorbed in virtually countless super high speed flashes called abbases, which may, by the way, have some relationship to the mysterious instantaneous appearance and disappearance of electron positron pairs in a vacuum. From a human developmental perspective, that means under the right circumstances at any point in time in the moment of transformation to the highest states of consciousness, we could remain there or at the very least change in some way. With respect to what happens to be, what appears to be predictive phenomena um, in REG research, as just described, Kashmir Shaivism posits that we transform into states of consciousness above space and time repeatedly due to the abbasas. When in the state of space and above space and time, then, we would have access to all information, whether past, present, or future. Most of the time, most of us aren't conscious of this experience, but we may not need to be conscious of it for the REGs to register these discrete events. And furthermore, by now, a large percentage of the population does some kind of a psycho-spiritual practice, whether it's meditation, prayer, contemplation, and that alone may enhance the registering of these events with the REGs. Similar reasoning could help explain remote viewing or any of the other predictive or retrospective anomalous phenomena. And Lastly, to address the nature of UFOs with this model, as I stated earlier, one of a number of the aspects of the model of manifestation is that there are perceivers at various stages of this universal manifestation. A medi the meditation master most responsible for introducing Kashmir Shaivism to the West, um, Swami Muktananda, once entered into discussion with a UFO researcher in the mid-70s regarding this phenomena, and in part he said this, it's true that only through spirituality and faith can you discover the truth about UFOs. UFOs do exist, and the inhabitants of higher realms do visit the Earth. They can also take on any form they choose. He went on to provide other information, including the fact that this has been happening from ancient times, that these beings from another higher plane come to do beneficial and helpful things, often to spiritually initiate people here on Earth. But people tend to be frightened and don't understand what's happening. The planes or vibrational levels referred to here are those above space-time again in this Kashmir Shaivism model and the pure creation. These higher planes also represent the higher states of consciousness of yogis who perform psycho-spiritual practices. So in closing, in order to truly understand universal reality or the reality of the universe, Kashmir Shaivism maintains that a person should attempt to attain the realization that they are one with consciousness. It would seem then that we as scientists who are searching for the truths of the universe, each in our own way, could benefit greatly by striving to attain these levels, as Kashmir Shaivism would say, that ultimately reach that level of supreme consciousness. Thank you. Uh, 
Another model uh, of the relationship between Purusha and Prakriti mm -hmm. uh, 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 comes out of the evolutionary perspective, uh, where we're uh, uh, breathing in the spirit and out the manifestation, but in, in time. And, of course, with special relativity, we all have different frames of reference, but if the universe is expanding more or less evenly, then we can talk about uh, uh, time unfolding in more of a linear way. Uh, do you see any hope for an integration of Eastern and Western perspectives in, 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 in regarding this issue? I sure hope so. Actually, in all the work I do, I, I tend to want to help with the bridging, even if it's in when it has to do with complementary medicine. <laughs> I, because I think that with, with the combination, there's, there's going to be such an, if you will, synergy of not only development, but also, also I think, improvement in, in health and well-being if, if we can begin to pull this in. And I don't think it has to be um, seen as something that's not scientific. I think as we look at some of these other models, these especially the Eastern models, there are intimations of some of the things that we're discovering or continuing to discover about in physics today and in other areas. So I see a lot of hope and I personally know a number of scientists who draw both from their their personal sp psycho-spiritual um, readings and study as much as from their scientific work to get inspiration. So yeah, I, I, we could all use the inspiration to move forward with things, I think. Yeah. Just a question regarding Gnosticism. Do you connect it with, your, with what you're doing uh, regarding knowledge and the higher realms? Um, I specialize more in one in this particular area, I know a little bit about other areas, but I don't claim to be an expert. So I think there are a number, obviously, the reason there are so many paths and ways of understanding or attempting to understand the world are there's so many different types of us who are looking to understand it. So I, I see them all, including Gnosticism, as some valid ways of, of coming to these understandings. How do you go about changing a linear belief system, which is Western civilization, into a nonlinear belief system, which is Eastern civilization? And even the process in which they, ob they observe things is different than the way we observe things. They see the whole picture, we see a spot. They process mathematics differently than we do. So there is a definite cultural disadvantage. We're talking two languages that don't even seem to be on the same page. There's that's, no translation, what yeah. I'm saying. Good point, good point. I think that's why the translational work is so important. And I think there are more and more of us that are attempting to do that very thing. Not only because of the cultural differences, but the human developmental differences as well. Nobody knows exactly where any of us are with that. And I think the more we can study and learn from each other and each other's cultures, the, the broader uh, um, an area we're going to be able to come to understand. But you're right, there are many differences, and I, but I think they're overcomable, if that's a word. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria.